Welcome to the 2021 Hagerstown Community College Virtual Earth Day. My name is Jane Choi Doan, and I'm the coordinator of the Environmental Studies Program here at Hagerstown Community College. I hope you have learned a lot from the movie, The Story of Plastic. If you have not had a chance to watch it, it will be available free to the public until Friday the 23rd. For HCC faculty, staff, and students, you can watch it anytime. We are grateful to have Dr. James Clauber, president of HCC, join us today. Dr. Clauber, would you like to say a few words before we get started? You bet. Well, it was that was an incredible movie, and I got to watch the whole thing through, believe it or not. I, and I was kind of looking and seeing who all, it looks like we had more and more people go as, uh, as the movie went along. So it was, um, it was really good, and I really appreciate it. I tell you, it's just such an incredibly complex issue that um, I don't even know that we could get it together in an hour and a half uh, for, for this show. So many, um, so many different issues behind uh, plastic production. Um, and I, what really brought to my mind uh, is, you know, the need to feed billions and billions of people affordably, especially as people in Africa and, and Southeast Asia are uh, enjoying a standard of living they probably have not ever had in, in, in any generation that preceded them makes it more even complex uh, as you go forward. Uh, you know, the idea of moving to, you know, zero plastics is great. I can remember growing up in Greenwood, South Carolina, where Coca-Cola had a bottling plant and, you know, we returned, I know this makes me feel like I'm ancient, but we returned our uh, bottles and the plant washed the insides of them out and refilled them with Coke and capped them. And then they were sent back to the grocery store to be resold again. So, um, you know, maybe the era of that plastic, I mean, that, that glass bottle is gone, but, you know, perhaps we need to relook at, uh, at that type of, of lifestyle. I will say this, I see a lot, um, Jane, I see a lot of HCC employees uh, on this, this Zoom. And I wanna challenge each and every one of you. I made this decision on my own in uh, 2012. And yes, this is plastic, but I have not used a K cup in my home and probably very few of them um, in my work life since 2012. So I've gone nine years without them. And I tell you quite frankly, quality of the coffee is better because you can go out and pick out the kind of coffee you want and put it in your own, your own K cup. But, you know, I think this K cup uh, impersonator, I don't know what you would call it, uh, probably cost me four or five dollars uh, nine years ago. Uh, you can get them on Amazon, and you know I would think we ought to have every employee, you know, have one of these, you know, for that if that Keurig that might be sitting in uh, your group room, uh, you know, group kitchen, wherever you are on campus. You know, it's one thing, but it's something. Almost like a little boy who. Uh, was seen throwing uh, starfish back in the ocean. And someone said, why are you doing that? He said, what difference does it make? And he says, well, it makes a difference for that one. So, you know, wherever we can make a reduction, I certainly would urge you to do so. But thank you for having me. And I'm gonna stick around and listen to you guys for a little bit before I have to jump off. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clover. Today, I'm very excited about our panelists. We'll discuss different aspects of the plastic crisis, the effects on human health, the politics and the economics involved, the environmental injustice and the racism that occurs way too often, and what happens to the plastics and the plastic bags in Maryland, specifically here in Washington County. We hope that the movie and panel discussion will be informative and motivate each and every one of you to reduce plastic use. At the end of the panel discussion, there should be an opportunity to have your questions answered. So you can type your questions into the chat, and if you would like a specific panelist to address your question, please include the panelist's first name with your question. We will do our very best to answer everyone's question in the time allowed. At the end of the Q&A, Ms. Becky McDermott, our development coordinator, will share some final thoughts. Now I would like to introduce my predecessor and mentor, Dr. Rebecca Beecroft. Well, am, has my screen been shared? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Choi Doan. Hello, and thank you to all of our audience for sticking around for the panel discussion. I'm going to provide you with a brief introduction of how and why plastic pollution affects wildlife and human health. 
The first several slides recap and expand on information introduced in the video. But let's start by putting a few numbers to the problem of plastic. Globally, nearly 360 million tons of plastic were produced in 2018, and of all the plastic that has ever existed, more than half was produced in the last 15 years. Let's face it, we humans have a tendency to think that everything we throw away or recycle just goes away or gets made into something else. Unfortunately, that is not always the case, and we are paying for our messy, wasteful, consumer-driven way of life with the health of the environment and ultimately with our own health. Wealthy countries such as the United States are responsible for most of the consumption of plastics. According to World Watch, the yearly consumption of plastics in North America equals about 220 pounds per person per year, mostly in the form of packaging. Try to imagine what 220 pounds of plastic looks like, keeping in mind that even large pieces of plastic are light in weight. Now multiply that 220 pounds by the population of the United States, which right now is around 326 million. It comes out to just under 72 billion pounds. That's a really big number. And I cannot even begin to imagine what that much plastic looks like. The problem is that plastic consumption leads to plastic pollution. One estimate is that more than 8 million tons of plastic waste enter the ocean each year which is equal to dumping a garbage truckload of plastic into the ocean. Not every week or even every day, but every single minute of every day. You might say, but I recycle, which is a good thing. But even recycling can be the problem in that most of the plastics for recycling are shipped to less developed countries for reprocessing where they become a principal source of both air and water pollution. You see, the problem with plastic is that it never really goes away, and the ocean is the ultimate destination for most of the plastic pollution. The ocean receives plastic waste from two main sources. 80% of it enters from the land, mainly via our rivers, while 20% is put directly into the ocean, most often in the form of lost fishing gear. Because plastics are not biodegradable, it does not decompose like paper products or other vegetable matter would. But plastic does degrade over time meaning that it breaks apart into smaller and smaller pieces due to the action of sunlight, wind, and water. And the chemicals in plastic leach out into the environment. These broken bits of plastic are called microplastics. The tiniest ones, as tiny as a virus, are called nanoplastics. Microplastics are classified as either primary or secondary microplastics. Primary ones are those materials that were originally manufactured to be that size, such as the nurdles that were mentioned in the film. These are used to make all types of plastic products. And then there are the microbeads, which are found in things like toothpaste, body scrubs, and scouring powders. Primary microplastics eventually make their way into streams and into the ocean, as they are too small to be removed at wastewater treatment facilities. Secondary microplastics are those that come from the fragmentation and weathering of larger plastic items. And this can take place either on land or in water. It's interesting to note that plastic uh, microplastics have even been found at the top of Mount Everest, believed to have been shed from the climbing gear and outdoor clothing. The problem with microplastics is that they persist in the environment. They do not dissolve like salt or sugar in the water, but remain suspended at varying depths depending on their size and mass. This means that they are found throughout the water column from the very surface all the way down to the sediment at the very bottom of the ocean. Because of this, they are easily ingested by any aquatic organism that filter feeds. Filter feeders include clams and oysters, zooplankton, krill, small fish like herring, herring, and even large baleen whales. Microplastics that are ingested by filter feeders can block their digestive tract and lead to starvation and death, but they can also accumulate in the bodies of filter feeders. And as chemi chemicals leach out of the plastics, they can accumulate in the tissues of the organism as well. This accumulation is called bioaccumulation. The filter feeders are not the only ones harmed. Anything that eats a filter feeder also ingests plastics and the toxic chemicals. For example, the zooplankton pictured here on this slide reveals ingested microplastics that were treated with glow-in-the-dark chemicals so that they could easily be seen with a microscope. This tiny zooplankton is an important food source in aquatic food webs. 
and forms the basis for aquatic, for most aquatic food webs. Let's say that this zooplankton consumes just one piece of a microplastic, which of course is very conservative, but for the sake of understanding how this works, it will make the math easy. A typical ocean food chain consists of the following. You start with a zooplankton. It's eaten by a smaller fish, like a sardine. And then that in turn is eaten by a mackerel, who in turn becomes a meal for a tuna. And eventually there's a human that eats the tuna. Remember that in the example, the zooplankton had consumed just one piece of microplastic. If the sardine eats just 10 zooplankton, they now have 10 pieces of microplastic in their body. If the mackerel eats just 10 sardines, they now contain about 100 pieces of microplastic. And if a tuna just eats 10 mackerel, they now have 1,000 pieces of microplastics. So if a human just ate one tuna a year, in this scenario, they would be consuming 1,000 pieces of microplastic, plus all of the chemicals released by those plastics into the tissues of the fish. This is how bioaccumulation of microplastics leads to biomagnification of microplastics at each level of a food web. Now, this does not mean you need to stop eating fish. Just be aware of the problem and learn which fish is safest to eat. You should probably limit your intake of any of the top predators, such as tuna, swordfish, steak, and even orange roughy. There is scientific evidence that supports the idea that this plastic pollution affects wildlife in numerous ways. All of us are familiar with the tragic images of animals entangled in plastic. I want to assure you that the shorebird in this image was freed from the, freed from the plastic bag by the photographer who took the picture. Otherwise, I wouldn't have used it. Um, otherwise, this bird, like many other animals, would have died. Wildlife also ingests larger plastic debris, mistaking it for food, which can lead to starvation as it is not digested and takes up space in the stomach meant to be occupied by real food. The toxic chemicals associated with plastic are more insidious and have been shown to cause endocrine disruption, reproductive issues, reduced growth, altered development, and dysfunctional neurological processes. In wildlife, it is not a big leap, leap then to assume that human health may also be impacted by plastic pollution. We've already established that plastic contains toxic chemicals added during manufacturing of the plastic that are able to leach into the environment as it degrades. But plastic also acts like a sponge, soaking up other persistent organic pollutants that are found in the water, such as PCBs and PAHs, which I'm not going to describe now. Both of these, though, are known to be toxic to humans and wildlife. Once the plastic is ingested, these persistent organic pollutants then leach out of the plastic into the tissues of the organism. Because these chemicals are fat soluble, they are absorbed into the fatty tissue where they remain for exceptionally long periods of time. Two of the chemicals that are used to make plastic, BPA and phthalates are also fat soluble and are thought to behave in much the same way. So what does this mean? Well, the research is young in this field and there is much left to learn, but there is emerging evidence that suggests that chemicals like these may be linked to endocrine disruption, cancer, birth defects, reproductive issues, impaired immunity, and developmental disorders in humans. At each point along the continuum of plastic production, toxic materials are released, leading to environmental exposure to the toxins associated with plastics. The most common routes of exposure are through direct contact with the skin, inhalation into the lungs, and ingestion through the food we eat and the water we drink. So what can we do to protect ourselves from the exposure to these toxins? It's a good question. Toxic chemicals are released into the air so we breathe them. They're released into their water so we drink them. How are we supposed to protect ourselves? First of all, Try to be aware of where the toxins come from and stay informed. Knowledge is power. And then become involved. Michael Brandt will be sharing information about the Zero Waste Initiative later in the pan panel discussion. Also, keep in mind that humans are apex predators, which means that we feed at the very top of the food web where bioaccumulation and biomagnification has the greatest impact. 
But here are several tangible steps you can take to reduce your use of and your exposure to plastic and the chemicals that leach from plastic. First of all, know your fish. Some fish are more prone to harbor toxic chemicals than others. Secondly, avoid using plastic containers to store food whenever possible. Don't use plastic straws. Take your own reusable bags to the store. If you must drink water out of single-use plastic bottles, don't reuse the bottles. Plastic that is old or damaged leaches more chemicals. Also, never freeze water in a plastic bottle or drink water from a plastic water bottle that has been left in a hot car. Number four, do not, eat anything, do not heat anything in the microwave in a plastic container. Use glass instead. Five, read the labels. BPA is often used as a liner in canned food and beverages. If it doesn't say BPA free, it probably isn't. Number six, if you must use plastic, recycle it when possible and trash it securely when necessary. Number seven, we can all demand clean water and clean air from our government. Laws are there for a reason. Make sure they're being enforced and that they are adequate. And lastly, look for ways to reduce plastic use in your own life, getting involved with cleanup efforts and become an advocate for reducing the use of plastic in our, in our society. These are just a few ways that you can reduce your exposure to plastic. You can also Google how to reduce my use of plastic waste and you'll find many more. I also recommend you go to Google today because it has a really cute little animation for Earth Day. Um, I will now hand it over to Dr. Eric Schwartz who will speak with you regarding the economic and political climate that has shaped the production and consumption of plastic. Thank you for listening. Hello. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, and uh, happy Earth Day. The, uh, that was such a powerful film. Uh, I uh, recognize as I was watching that uh, some of the points are, are going to be touched on in my presentation. So we have a lot of, uh, a lot of speakers, so I'm going to uh, jump right into it. Um, the I'm talking today about the economics and politics of plastic pollution. The which is as I mentioned was was discussed. And some of the some of the uh, points should be familiar if you were able to watch the film. The issue of of plastic is inseparable from the economic and political questions that exist in the United States or globally as well. The problem is rooted in, in economics and politics, and the solution is also um, rooted in economics and politics. So about the economics first, uh, as mentioned, there are very powerful incentives to promote the use of plastics. And there is a lack of incentives to address the problem of pollution, plastic pollution in particular. The uh, US government, focused on the US government, has provided effectively subsidies for the extraction of fossil fuels, particularly uh, natural gas, that is um, key in the production of plastics today. And then another element on as far as uh, incentives or the, the cost structure here is that there is no, um, currently, ex the externalities, that is the costs of plastic pollution are not factored into the market price of plastics. If you actually had to factor in how much it will cost to get rid of to that, that uh, plastic bottle, how, what is it, what it's, environmental impact is that would no longer be so cheap and so the incentives to use it would no longer be so powerful so in regarding the lack of incentives to address the problem the when we think about the environment a clean environment we can think of it as a public good and this is there is always a uh, a problem to provide a public good without 
the involvement of some sort of uh, government entity. We don't have uh, private companies providing public goods as a rule at the level that they, at this society, wants them. So I'm not going too much into it. So as was mentioned in the film, you know, there was some, some plastic production started out with using mostly foreign petroleum. In recent years, we have seen this huge surge in fracking, that is um, hydraulic fracturing of geologic structures, underground geologic structures to extract oil and gas. So we have this uh, growth more than 1200% in the last um, 20 years. So we have now um, you know, nearly 2 million oil and gas fracking operations and essentially a problem of oversupply. What do you do with oversupply? Well, you need to find new use for it, right? So these uh, plastics are made from ethane and we have the construction of these new plants called ethane crackers. There's a picture of one a bit north of us in Monica, Pennsylvania. And as was mentioned in the film, there's this whole sort of alley of um, construction projects not coincidentally, perhaps it it, uh, it coincides with an area of large production of cracked gas. Right? These are huge enterprises. Uh, this particular complex will produce more than a million tons of plastic every year. It's hard to visualize. It's kind of, I hope it's uh, disturbing to visualize. Right? Uh, now, you might say, well, that's just the economy working, isn't the free market will fix everything. Well, for one, it's not actually just a free market, right? Uh, because these, th these products are, are uh, coming from frac gas, which actually was subsidized effectively by the US government. So the US government has effectively subsidize the, the production of frac gas, which then is used to make lots, tons and tons and tons, millions of tons of plastic. And these, the, these uh, producers have all these incentives to push its use, as was discussed uh, very effectively in that film. So this um, production is, is uh, expected to increase by more than a third. Um, in the, come, in the near future. A little discussion about externalities, which was also mentioned in the film. I was happy to actually, very happy to see some of my points um, also referred to in the film. This externality is a side effect, consequence of industrial commercial activity. So if a factory, um, you know, makes widgets very, very cheaply and dumps all its waste into the river, it's not like that waste doesn't exist. It does. Somebody has to clean it up. But the manufacturer has effectively put that cost onto somebody else, right? Somebody later else later is gonna is is gonna clean up that river. It's not like it it doesn't exist. So in the same sense, all these costs of plastic production are not priced into the product. So it is in in fact um, artificially much cheaper than it would be if we were. Uh, pricing the, the full cost into the product. So this is all, um, uh, one point I wanted to make, and I, I think this is also mentioned in the film, that, that when we talk about uh, the environmental impact of plastic, it's not just the litter on the beach. It is atmospheric pollution, it is water pollution. Uh, the actual, it's not just the burning of plastics, which is discussed in the film, but it's also the production of plastics, which is just uh, um, has a very negative effect on the atmosphere. Um, when we think about a public good, I, I discussed this just briefly because in terms of it ties into the political aspect too, that, that the provision of, of public good um, politically organizations or that are that are trying to provide a public good tend to have less power politically because they're providing something for all of us. So I don't need to 
participate or contribute in order to obtain the benefit of that public good, right? So that is, I'm effect effectively a free rider. There's always a free rider problem. So um, this is the uh, the economic problem that it is it is uh, um, not effectively priced. Where is where is where do our problems go? A lot of it goes overseas. Um, Kenya is just one example. And again, in the political aspect, the, the U.S. government put pressure on Kenya in order to take more of its waste, more plastic waste. And this is Kenya is not unique by any means. This is something that is uh, happens is, is whether whatever can, uh, continent we're talking about, whether it's Southeast Asia or Africa. Um, regarding politics, uh, the you you have probably heard the the term lobby. Um, community colleges uh, are have uh, are represented by lobbies. There's all sorts of different lobbies. Well, a very powerful lobby uh, represents the interests of oil and gas producers and the plastics manufacturers. Um, these lobbies tend to have much more power than the lobbies that are organized around the provision of a public good, such as the Sierra Club, for example. They're much more funded. They have, with, with funding comes more access, more, um, more influence, right? And they spend a lot of money. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars spent in just in the United States political system, right? They are spending a lot of money to get access to policymakers to influence policy, right? And it is not a necessarily a Democratic or Republican issue, although there are certain um, tendencies to say. So what can you do, right? That's a fundamental, what can you do, right? Um, yes, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Beecroft uh, pointed out, protect yourself from plastic consumption, but also be an informed consumer. Wherever you can avoid buying plastic materials, do so. Avoid, avoid buying packaging, plastic packaging, wherever possible. Provide your own packaging. We bring, bring a bag, your own bag to the grocery store. Reuse it again and again. Right? Pack, you know, it's, it's uh, very easy, but it, it adds up. And as informed citizens, and I'm a, a big believer in participating politically, Investigate the people you vote for. Investigate who is funding their campaigns. Ask questions of them. And finally, join with other people who care about this issue. We individually, we can have an impact, but we are our impact is increased when we act with others. So join up with environmental organizations that are organizing on these issues. If you want to learn more, here are some resources uh, the first two resources regard um, or let you track money, track money uh, contributions. And uh, the uh, other, the last two there are about uh, basically, specifically about plastics and its use. So with that, I'm going to pass the baton to Margaret Mothershed, who is going to talk about environmental racism and it's as it relates to plastic uh, pollution. All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Peggy Mothershed. I am a freshman at Hagerstown Community College and I'm just gonna give a more broad presentation on environmental justice and racism, where it intersects with plastics. Um, what is it, who's affected, how can I help? Okay, so just some basic definitions. Um, environmental racism is defined here as whether by conscious design or institutional neglect, actions and decisions that result in the disproportionate exposure of people of color to environmental hazards and environmental health burdens. And environmental justice has goals such as protecting everyone um, to the same degree from environmental and health hazards, and also allowing everyone to have equal access to a healthy living, learning and working environment. Environmental justice is the movement to combat environmental racism. So they do go hand in hand. 
Um, we're going to start off with some statistics. Um, about 70% of contaminated waste sites are in low income neighborhoods. 11.2% of African American children, 4% of Mexican American children, and 2.3% of white children will be poisoned by lead throughout their uh, childhood. Three out of five African Americans live in communities with uncontrolled waste sites, and Black households that earn between 50 and 60,000 per year live in neighborhoods that are more polluted than white households that earn below $10,000 per year. So it is clearly not just a socioeconomic issue at this point. Probably the most famous example of environmental racism is gonna be Flint, Michigan. Um, this happened in the early 2010s, starting in 2012, I believe. Um, and this issue basically happened when the state of Michigan took over Flint's finances because they had a budget deficit. Um, and while they were building a new pipeline that connected Lake Huron to Flint, Michigan, they switched over the water line from the Flint River to Flint, Michigan, and the pipes hadn't been used in a while, so the pipes were corroded and exposed 100,000 residents to elevated levels of lead in their water for years. Um, it was fixed recently, but understandably, many people still do not trust the water system. Another example is Cancer Alley in Louisiana. It's nicknamed Cancer Alley. Um, it's an 85 mile stretch along the Mississippi River with 150 oil refineries, many of them in the plastic manufacturing sector. In 2002, they had the second highest cancer death rate in the United States. And in the black areas of the parish, um, there are two times as many cancer cases as in the white areas of that same parish. Um, and probably the most well known from a historical standpoint is Warren County, North Carolina. Dr. Beecroft um, spoke a little bit earlier about PCBs, uh, polychlorinated biphenyls. And this basically happened when a white entrepreneur in North Carolina bought up thousands and thousands of pounds of plastic that were made with PCBs. Um, and PCBs can cause horrible birth defects, very, very high cancer rates. So they're very toxic. And his idea was basically to melt down this plastic and resell it to manufacturing sites in Pennsylvania to be made into new plastics. And when he realized that that was not an efficient way um, to make money, he basically went throughout eight counties in North Carolina and sprayed plastics on all of the roadways. Um, and eventually him and his sons ended up just getting a slap on the wrist for it. I think the most they got was two years in prison and 10,000 truckloads eventually had to be picked up um, with these horrible PCBs laced throughout. And they wanted to dump the 10,000 truckloads into one of the highest density black counties in North Carolina. Um, unfortunately, it did happen eventually, but this sparked the environmental racism and justice movement, and that is actually where the term environmental racism was coined. So a more local example is Brandywine, Maryland. Um, if you look at the map in the top right, the darker gray the area is, the larger population percentage that is black. Um, and the individual icons are um, different operating or proposed power plants throughout the state of Maryland. So you can see even in Western Maryland where there is a higher percentage of the black population, there's a power plant there. There are also power plants surrounding Baltimore and currently two operating power plants with three proposed power plants in the Brandywine, Maryland with a much larger percentage of black population than the, re than the rest of Maryland. Um, as well as dealing with the pollution from these power plants, they also have a Superfund site. And Superfund sites are basically sites with toxic waste that was improperly managed in the past. And for this example, um, this is a military toxic waste dump that was in operation for over 40 years that contaminated soil and groundwater, and it's still undergoing cleanup efforts. So as well as having all of the power plants and the Superfund site, um, Prince George's County ranks consistently as having the worst air pollution in Maryland, many times high enough to violate state and national air quality standards. So how does this happen? We've seen examples that it does happen, but how does it get this bad? Well, the number one way that this happens socially is through redlining. This mostly affects housing in Maryland. Um, the main way that this happens is through denial of mortgages and loans um, and also real estate agents just flat out not showing people houses in areas that don't correspond with their ethnicity. 
So for example, if I were to move to a different city, I would most likely be shown houses that were in a majority white neighborhood. Um, whereas if my African-American friend were to move to a different city, they would most likely be shown houses only in neighborhoods that corresponded with their ethnicity. This does create a kind of um, modern day segregation. And if that same friend were to try to move into a white neighborhood, they might be denied mortgages or loans that would put them in a place to be able to afford moving into that neighborhood. Um, another way that environmental racism happens is power plants and waste processing sites being placed into low income neighborhoods. So we saw that a little bit with Cancer Alley. Um, it just continues to drive down the property values of these neighborhoods. So basically, if you live in one of these neighborhoods, you're trapped because it is so cheap that these companies can move there. Um, and once they move there, the property values just dip even lower. So you cannot afford to move out of these neighborhoods. And also what we saw in the movie was plastic flow into countries that don't have the infrastructure to deal with it. So the main way that this happens is higher income countries shipping their waste, or in this case, recyclables, to countries that just don't have the infrastructure to process it. And a lot of times it does end up in the low income neighborhoods. And the only people that directly benefit from this are the companies that can use the cheap plastic one use packaging and move on. And they're they don't experience a lot of backlash from that a lot of times. So what's happening now? January 27th, President Biden um, created a Council on Environmental Justice. I believe there are 25 people that sit on that council from around the United States. Um, it's a step in the right direction, but I don't believe we have seen much out of it at this point. There is also still um, many environmental groups that focus specifically on environmental justice around the United States such as We Act for Environmental Justice in New York. They are mainly based out of Northern Manhattan and they focus on air quality and environmental protection for the Harlem area. And also the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice that focuses on building relationships between universities and communities and founding educational campaigns in those communities centered around environmental justice. And an update on the Flint, Michigan scandal. Um, in early 2019, the water was deemed safe to drink, but understandably, a lot of people still don't trust the water supply. And Governor Rick Snyder, who was governor at the time, was charged with two counts of willful neglectful duty on January 20th of this year. So how can we help? Uh, we see that it happens. We've seen how it happens. So the number one way that we can help is probably self-education. Whenever there's questions or whenever things come up in the news, the major way that we can help is just by doing some research. If you're interested, um, spread the information to your friends, to your family, get them informed as well. Also holding representatives accountable. Um, I know that we might not have much support in Western Maryland for environmental um, justice, but definitely getting a hold of even your local city council members, local mayors, if they have policies on the table that might affect environmental justice, get a hold of them, get a hold of some of our state and national representatives, just let them know how you feel. Also um, elevating the voices of affected communities. This is a major one. Um, for example, if I were to go to um, go into a discussion about Cancer Alley um, in Louisiana, I might have a bigger platform automatically than someone who's directly affected by that. So I just need to check myself and make sure that I'm letting them have a larger platform than me and making sure that their voices are heard and also boycotting when necessary. A major issue that's happening right now is a lot of companies are greenwashing themselves which just means they make themselves look a lot better than they actually are. Um, whether that's talking about goals, but then not actually putting any policies into place to achieve those goals or talking about recycling, but then also not having any plans um, to build the infrastructure for the recycling. Um, just definitely boycotting, getting the information out on social media, friends and family. All right, so thank you. I'm going to pass this over to Anthony Drew. He is the recycling coordinator for Washington County, and he is going to give more of a local perspective on recycling. Thank you, Peggy. Enjoyed it. Uh, my name is Anthony Drury, and I am the recycling coordinator for Washington County. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, recycling in Washington County, the opportunities that you had to recycle some things you may not know about recycling in our county and the good and the not so good about recycling in Washington County. 
Um, your opportunities to recycle here are largely based on where you live within the county. If you live in the city limits of Hagerstown or one of the many towns in our county that offer curbside recycling, then you already are aware of how easy and fairly effortless it is to recycle. For those of you not fortunate enough to live in one of these areas, you will either have to pay a trash and recycling company to provide you with curbside recycling, or you will have to purchase a recycling permit through the Washington County Solid Waste Department that will allow you to recycle at our landfill or any of the four convenience centers we have throughout the county. Right now, these are pretty much your only options, unfortunately. Uh, in Washington County, we have what I like to call the big three. Uh, these are the top three trash and recycling companies that offer these services within the county. These, co these companies are Apple Valley Waste, Republic Services, and Waste Management. If you aren't using one of these companies to collect your recyclables, they probably aren't being properly recycled and may be thrown directly into the trash. This is because the larger companies can afford to collect recyclables and transport them to the local material recovery facility or MRF as they are often referred to. The smaller companies unfortunately don't really have the money or the opportunities to properly recycle at this time. Uh, a quick sidebar here though, I do have a lot of people who ask me is our recycling really being recycled in the county and the answer is yes, it really is. Um, the only time it's not is if it's uh, contaminated with other materials or it's just plain dirty. Um, I'll talk a little bit more, more about the contamination issue here in a minute, but um, just know that um, it's, it's not beneficial to the companies not to recycle. There's still money to be made, so they're, they're going to do the best they can to, to uh, recycle everything that's out there. And um, let's see here. They're talking about the local uh, material recovery facility or the MRF, we are very fortunate to have one here locally. Um, let's see, we have it, it's right here in Washington County, it's um, off of Hopewell Road, and uh, our local MRF is actually owned by Apple Valley Waste, but other companies do have the ability to pay Apple Valley to take their recyclable materials. Uh, I was very fortunate to uh, recently have a conversation with the manager of this facility and uh, we talked specifically about plastics. Um, some of the more interesting things that came out of that conversation were, first and foremost, uh, they do not want any plastic bags or stretchy plastic material ever in the recycling containers, which will then end up in their facility. Uh, what happens is those, those materials do get stuck in their rollers and uh, cause major time delays of, as they have to shut everything down in order to pull that plastic out of those rollers. Uh, best thing to do with plastic bags, as was mentioned a little bit earlier, take them to your local Walmart or grocery store. They will in turn be taken to Trex in Winchester, Virginia, where they will be made into uh, decking material, uh, benches, and other outside and other outside furniture. Let's see. I'm sorry. Um, so some of the other things that came out of that conversation. Numbers one, two, and five are your best plastics to recycle and are the most profitable. Number four plastic is a PVC plastic and is cancer causing. No recycling company really wants it, so it's better to put it in the trash, unfortunately. Uh, for plastic bottles, a great rule of thumb is if the neck of the bottle or container is smaller than the body, it is recyclable. So uh, let me say that once again, if the neck is smaller, it's recyclable, no need to even look for a number. Um, also, they would rather you keep the lids on these containers because as they go through the recycling process, the lids are actually separated and recycled for other pro products such as paint cans. Um, I tell folks usually when they ask, uh, make sure that the bottle is completely empty, squeeze as much air out of the container as you can, and then put the lid back on, which will secure that in place. Uh, he did actually mention something that I would, had never heard before. Um, but they don't want the black plastics. Um, these would include uh, plastics that you get if you buy like a microwavable meal or something like that. Um, the reason uh, that they, and when I say they, I mean the plastic processors don't want the black plastic is because it has to burn at a much higher rate in order to turn it into a liquid. Um, unfortunately, when it does that, it actually destroys the much better clear and lighter plastics. So they would rather not have them. So um, here's some here's some of the good things that are currently going on with recycling in the county. We have had some rough years, um, but despite rising costs of recycling, citizens and businesses continue to recycle. 
COVID has put a wrinkle in our recycling numbers, unfortunately, for the past year, but uh, we're hoping that as this is going away, that our numbers will start to rise again. Um, currently at the 40 West Landfill, you as a Washington County citizen can recycle metal. Uh, you can also recycle use motor oil, antifreeze, use vegetable oil, cardboard, and rechargeable batteries, all free of charge, just as a uh, Washington County citizen. Within the last year, we've added containers at every location for used clothing and shoes, and all of these donations do actually stay right here in Washington County. Well, uh, every year, new laws are passed to help increase recycling in the state of Maryland. And um, in my opinion, one of the best laws I've seen passed in the last 10 years has been the apartment building and condo recycling law. This basically states that any apartment building or condominium complex with 10 or more units must offer recycling to their tenants. Um, so if you happen to know of a facility of this size and they aren't offering recycling, feel free to give me a call. Uh, I have folks do it all the time. I never mention any names, but I do go out and then do, do some inspections. And if they're in violation, I, I just uh, talk to them or send them a letter and uh, they usually fix the problem very quickly. Uh, on the not so good side, um, probably the one thing that hurts us more than anything here in Washington County is our geographic location. It's definitely a detriment to us as far as recycling goes. Part of my job is to find other recycling opportunities whenever I can. And I've been told many times by companies I have approached that they do not want to service us because of our location. Uh, they basically don't want to travel over the mountains past Frederick. And unfortunately, we missed out on some great opportunities because of this. And it also increases our costs in other recycling programs. So uh, not everything can be recycled everywhere. This is very true. Uh, the plastic industry has done a great job in making all of us believe that if there's a chasing arrow symbol on something, you can feel good about throwing that item into a recycling container. Basically, all that symbol means is that that item can be recycled somewhere, uh, not necessarily where you are, unfortunately. So if you ever have any questions about particular items, you can feel free to call me or check with your local recycling company, whoever's taking your, taking your recycling. Um, unfortunately, due to increasing contamination costs, the new mantra for recycling is, if in doubt, throw it out. Um, contamination has thrown the recycling industry into a free fall the last few years and was the major cause of China's national sword that we heard about in the movie. So what can we do to help? Well, I'm glad you asked. First, exactly what we're doing now, outreach and education. An educated recycler will almost always do what's right. Second, as we talked about earlier, buy responsibly, either no plastic or limited plastic and definitely no plastics intended for single use. And third, recycle responsibly. Now, what I mean by this is to always read any signs that might be associated with wherever you're dropping your recyclables. And if you're not sure, feel free to ask questions. Just remember, if in doubt, throw it out. And that's all based on the whole contamination issue that we're having right now. So these next few slides that I have are just some examples. And then when I say some, I mean, I could I could pull five a day from, from just our containers here at the landfill. So it's just some quick examples of contamination. Uh, that's a if you can see that properly, that's a chainsaw that was torn apart. There's there's rags in that box. This has miscellaneous metal parts, car parts, things of that nature. Plastic hangers, which unfortunately uh, we see a lot of those because they do have the numbers on them, but our local facilities just don't take the plastic hangers. And unfortunately, we don't have any facility locally that does. So they would either have to be donated or put into the trash, I hate to say. Um, any metal, I mean, the, these are, your recycling container is going to take metal cans, soup cans, things of that nature. They're not going to take your, your dish satellite <laughs> when you're moving. And believe it or not, we even have kitchen sink shelf from time to time. So you never know what you're going to see in these recycling containers. Um, so just uh, another uh, thing to keep in mind is that approximately 75% or more of what we consider to be trash may indeed be recyclable. Once again, I thank you for attending. Please feel free to contact me with any questions or concerns you might have. That's my number, my direct email, and then that's also the uh, Washington County website. And now I'm going to turn things over to Michael Brandt with the Washington County Sierra Club, who will talk about zero waste.
Okay, um, thank you, Anthony, for that, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I am Michael Brandt. I am the uh, rep, the Washington County representative for the Sierra Club's Zero Waste Leadership Team. Thank you to everyone for um, sticking with us this long. I know this has been an awful lot of information to digest. Um, but I am the last panelist, so we're almost done. Um, and what I would like to talk to you about today are really two things. Uh, first of all, what is Sierra Club's Zero Waste Initiative? Who are we? What do we do? And how can you participate if you are interested? And then secondly, I'd like to talk a little bit about Maryland's recent legislative session. There were a number of zero waste bills involved in that. And in particular, I want to focus on the Plastic Bag Reduction Act, which hopefully will tie well back into some of the things that were discussed in the movie and by some of my fellow panelists. So first of all, um, zero waste initiative, what is it? Well, as you can probably imagine, um, reducing waste is one of the highest priorities for the Sierra Club all the way at the highest level. What the Maryland chapter has done, and I do believe there are a few other states within the Sierra Club who are doing something similar, but the Maryland chapter has formed what's called the Zero Waste Leadership Team, which has representatives from all of the different counties that have Sierra Club groups, which is most of the state. Um, and that's just the leadership team, but when we talk about the Zero Waste group in its entirety, it is not just Sierra Club members. Anyone who is interested in participating or learning or anything, having anything to do with zero waste is welcome to sign up and be included in what we do. Um, at last count, which was about a week or so ago, I checked, we had more than 300 active participants within the Zero Waste Initiative. And I should have added it to this slide, but I believe if memory serves, we have one dozen from Washington County. So there is plenty of opportunity for growth there, hint, hint. So what do we do? Uh, well, we have managed to stay pretty active even during the pandemic, although it has uh, put some of our activities on hold, hopefully temporarily. Um, but if it has anything to do with reduce waste, we are reducing waste, we are interested in it. Um, our efforts basically focus on finding any reasonable means to reduce waste. And that, of course, includes plastic waste, but, but not only plastic waste, although that is probably the priority right now and certainly the, the theme of today's discussion. We have a lot of interaction with government officials and agencies, other health departments, I'm sorry, health departments, other environmental groups, many of which have a lot of the same interests as us. Uh, we as a team learn from each other. We share ideas. Uh, often what is good for one county and effective in one county can be applied to other counties. And because the Maryland legislative session just wrapped up last week, the majority of this year so far has been focused on supporting a number of zero waste legislation bills that were in consideration. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into detail on all of these, but I do want to point out that we get involved in everything from relatively obscure bills like, uh, like taking incinerator ash uh, off the list of acceptable recycled materials, all the way up through high profile bills like the Plastic Bag Reduction Act. I also wanted to mention that several of these, uh, let's say the paint stewardship program, the synthetic turf chain of custody, and of course the Plastic Bag Reduction Act, these are all related to the EPR, the Extended Producer Responsibility that was discussed in the movie. And also I do just wanna mention that although not all of the bills that we support do get passed, we do, um, we do see that even as the little ones get passed, they do add up and, and do provide tangible progress. Every year, we do have some victories, whether large or small. 
So that is encouraging. And you can see here several of these passed in 2021. Those that didn't uh, will probably be up again in next year's session. So that's at a statewide level. What about locally? What do we do here? Well, of course, we're always open to any potential policy advances uh, within the, the world of zero waste, but those opportunities here are a little less frequent than they are in some other parts of the state for reasons that some of my fellow panelists have already mentioned. Um, we do still get involved in monitoring and sort of keeping track of things that get passed on the state level and those changes get filtered down to Washington County. A good example of that would be the styrofoam ban, which recently came into effect. And of course, any of the bills that passed this year will be taking effect in the near future and we'll be keeping tabs on those as well. Um, education is really a, a big thing. And I think everybody has mentioned that in their presentations today. There's so much to know. We are constantly educating ourselves we're helping each other out. And also we consider it one of our main activities to help educate the community. So that includes opportunities like this event today. We do have meetings with other local organizations, schools, churches, political groups, uh, really anyone who's willing to listen, um, we will certainly come and talk to them, consult with them, give presentations, whatever. Um, we do participate in local events, uh, Greensboro, I'm sorry, uh, Boonesboro Green Fest comes to mind, other uh, recycling and swapping events that expand upon the basic recycling that Anthony talked about. Um, we have done tours. The picture that you see here is Apple Valley Waste, which again, Anthony mentioned, and um, we were lucky enough to participate in a tour there right before the pandemic hit. Um, it was supposed to be a one hour tour. The people there were wonderful. They allowed us to stay two hours and answered all of our questions. And you see in the picture here, it's really a fascinating operation to see how they go from these massive piles of mixed materials into uh, basically smaller uh, lots for recycling. It was a really interesting tour. And of course we do, or we will in the future participate in cleanups, but all of these things are unfortunately on hold because all of our in-person group outings are suspended by the Sierra Club until the pandemic eases up. Um, to go into a little bit more detail, I thought it would be helpful to talk about the Plastic Bag Reduction Act in particular. Um, I wanted to talk about how our volunteer work leads directly into tangible progress, such as a, a new law. That's the ultimate goal of, of this. And because the theme of today is plastic, I thought the Plastic Bag Reduction Act would be a good one to focus on. So um, first of all, I want to talk about what is the Plastic Bag Reduction Act. Um, the movie did a great job of talking about how ubiquitous single-use plastics are. Um, some of the younger people here may not remember a time before grocery shopping meant getting five items and walking out of the store with three or four plastic bags, all of which have a lifespan of several minutes until you get home and throw them all away. It's incredibly wasteful. Well, the Plastic Bag Reduction Act is designed to put an end to that. It's not exactly turning off the tap to the bathtub that they mentioned in the, uh, in the movie, but it's certainly a contributor to that. So that is our ultimate goal is to cut back on waste anywhere we can. So this bill puts a ban on all single use plastic bags at retailers. It is Maryland's version of something that has been done in other states. They talked about this in California in the movie, um, as well as Certain localities already within Maryland are already doing this. It started, I believe, with Mon Montgomery County a few years ago. It has expanded to more and more of the state. The goal of the bill is to incentivize shoppers to use reusable bags, mainly cloth reusable bags. Um, but basically, we want to avoid the single use um, grocery bags. Now, to that end, 
last year's version, the 2020 version, did include a store fee for paper bags. That, however, uh, was a little bit of a source of confusion and consternation, and it was removed from the 2021 version. Um, but it is important to remember that the focus or the goal of the bill is not to just replace plastic bags with paper bags, but rather to switch people over to using more reusable bags. So our role in this process began in 2019. We participated in something called a shopper survey. There were, I think, 10 or 12 of us who basically went around what the survey involved was in one hour shifts, we would observe customers coming out of the grocery stores and just make a notation of what types of bags they were using. Nothing more sophisticated than that. Plastic bags, paper bags, cloth bags, no bags at all, or a mix. And every uh, group around the state of Maryland participated in this. Every grocery store in those counties was observed to collect data. Then we compiled all that data at a state level. From compiling that data, we were able to call to, to, uh, to come to a couple of conclusions. The first one being in places where it was available, there was overwhelming use of single use plastics. I believe in Washington County, it was over 90% of customers used only the single use plastic, <clears throat> excuse me, plastic bags um, in the grocery stores. But a second lesson that we learned was there are places where the business model that was not using single use plastic bags was working. For example, here in Washington County in Hagerstown, both Aldi and Lidl were using uh, no single use plastic bags. And then as I mentioned, there were other localities around Maryland where the ban had already gone into effect. So we do know that it is a viable business model. We just have to encourage people to go that way. We presented that uh, compiled data to lawmakers, uh, helped consult in the drafting of the bill. And we have continued to provide the data from that survey as people have asked for it um, during the legislative session and, and, and outside the session as well. So our role did not stop there. Um, we continued to support not just the, the Plastic Bag Reduction Act, but all sorts of zero waste bills during the session. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that we can do that. Um, there's of course contacting your legislators uh, via emails, phone calls, letters. Um, Sierra Club sets up something called action alerts we, of course, also encouraged letters to the editor. We had one um, published by the Herald Mail. And some of the zero waste volunteers um, participated by giving testimony during the congressional committee sessions. And of course, there is always the spreading the word. There are, there's a lot of confusion and a lot of misconceptions about these bills. And the more that we can overcome those by just explaining the bills, um, that always helps as well. And uh, just, just as an aside, I wanted to point out that the Maryland Sierra Club supported over 100 bills this uh, in that way in 2021. So what's the current status of the Plastic Bag Reduction Act? Um, well, whenever you have a bill like this, you do, of course, have uh, people both for and against. We had law lawmakers both for and against, as well as some businesses um, were for and against a bill like this. And it's always important to, to take their concerns and, and their questions seriously. Um, there were a few, what I would call misconceptions or at least questions that we needed to answer um, related to this particular bill. And I've, I've mentioned them here. One is, I mentioned how in 2020, there was a store fee associated with paper bags that was characterized by some people as a tax, uh, even though the government was not involved in the collecting of it. So uh, it did cause enough angst that it was removed from the 2021 version. Another question or concern that came up was if we're gonna be replacing all of these plastic bags with paper bags, um, that could lead to a paper bag shortage. And a couple of things to address that. One is, of course, as I mentioned, the goal 
is not to just replace plastic bags with paper bags, but to encourage the use of reusable bags. Um, and I will point out also that when you use reusable bags, that is of course the least expense in the long run of anything. So there, um, there should not be any hidden expenses that we're having to pass on to the, to the small businesses and the consumers. So anyway, after a lot of discussion, the bill did pass through committee and then through the House of Delegates by a pretty overwhelming margin. Um, it was then carried over to the Senate committee, but unfortunately the session ended before the state Senate committee voted on it. So where does that leave us? Well, um, as I mentioned, it, it was pretty popular. It did pass the House of Delegates pretty easily. It is likely that we will see much the same bill again next year. Um, there are always lessons learned that we may figure out some adjustments to apply to the bill, but there's also going to be, um, again, more questions, more misconceptions out there that we can, oh, and I just see that I misspelled misconceptions. Uh, misconceptions that we can try to address before next year rolls around. Um, and let me just close by saying, I hope that some of you would like to participate and help us in this. Um, not just this bill, but there are a lot of good zero waste bills that we're working on and that we can actively work to support. And I think all of the things that we've learned from the movie and the other panelists today have emphasized just how important this work is. And so that if you are interested in joining the zero waste team, even if it's just to learn more about these things we're working on, I've included the link here. Please feel free to join us. And I would now like to pass it back for the Q&A. Right. Thank you, Michael. That was great. Uh, thanks, everybody. So a uh, couple of questions. Um, if anyone else got a question in their you know, private chat, you can um, share that. Uh, otherwise, I can start a question I have from Sylvie that was, I guess, to Michael. Uh, she asked, will policies like the Maryland single-use plastic bag bill help the plastic crisis and climate change if they aren't pushed on a national or worldwide level? Okay, Th thank you for that question. It's a good question. And of course, obviously, Maryland is, is only one state. We would be the ninth in the United States if we had passed it this year, um, unless someone else passed it this year, which is always possible. There are other states that are always considering similar type legislation. And what I will say this, what we've learned in Maryland, I think is also true on a larger scale, which is it's easier to get something done at a higher level when it's already being done and working and some of the kinks have been worked out at lower levels. So we've seen some of Maryland's counties pass pretty similar type bills in their own localities. And as more and more people see those working, that is really what made um, this bill possible to be discussed at a statewide level. So it is obviously, it's a legitimate concern. Um, how much can Maryland alone impact the entire pol plastic pollution? Um, but it is certainly, a legitimate step uh, of, of tangible progress. I hope that answers the question. Okay. All right, and then uh, I have a question from uh, Amiza. Even if we get to net zero emission or we halt the plastic production immediately, will that be enough to restore the damage we created? I guess this is open to anyone on the panel. You wanna jump in? <laughs> no. <laughs> There's a lot of cleanup to be done, uh, but the first step is to stop. You know, as I say, when you're in you know, the problems in a hole, stop digging. So in this case, it's, you know, stop the overproduction and overuse of plastics. That we have a we, we have decades worth of cleanup to do. That's just my two cents. On. Great. I might add to that that the environment has proven to be incredibly resilient. Um, and I think recovery would come over time, but it would be a long, long time. Uh, when you think about microplastics, um, they're not going to go away. When they settle out into the sediment at the bottom of the ocean, eventually they're going to be part of the sedimentary rocks that form. 
So I can imagine geologists studying rocks a million years from now and trying to figure out what in the heck this stuff is in the middle of all of the natural occurring uh, minerals that are in the rocks. Great. And then um, I have a question from Katie. It says, um, will ExxonMobil and other large companies ever take responsibility for their actions of pollution? Will they ever change the way they produce, well, I guess, accountability? You want to take that one? <laughs> Not unless they're forced, not unless they're forced. Uh, again, this is, has to do with consumer pressure and collective, you know, organizing pressure. Um, no one gives up power voluntarily, and, and that includes economic uh, issues as well. It, 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 we're seeing some response uh, from consumer pressure, and we see it in all different fields, whether it um, has to do with voting rights or pollution, but they're not going, to, a, a company is not going to on its own change behavior because it, it, you know, someone says it's the right thing to do. That's just my two, again, my two cents. It requires political and it requires social pressure. Jane, can I, can I throw something in there right behind uh, for Professor Schwartz, if I may? Of course, sir. Well, I, you know, I, I think he's right. Uh, and the interesting thing is, I spent a little time in the, in the state legislature down in South Carolina. And I tell you, the one group, I mean, certainly the oil companies have a lot of blame in this, in this, in this mess. But let's not forget the consumer products companies that are buying all this plastic and packaging all of this and the grocery store chains and, and all of those middle place uh, consumers before it reaches the end consumer, which is us. And um, I, I think that a lot of the oil companies are not as politically sensitive as the consumer products companies are politically sensitive. Now, granted, they have powerful lobbies. Eric, when I was in the legislature, they came down to South Carolina to repeal the soda tax. And I got to witness firsthand the power of PepsiCo and Coca-Cola and the rest of them when they want something in a state legislature, it's enormous. Um, and you can imagine all those groups are gonna fight for their turf. But one thing I've really watched a lot in recent years has been the uh, organic food movement. And I see what we have done in, uh, in the move towards organics uh, in a grocery store chains. Those entities are very receptive to political pressure and consumer pressure. And it only takes a little bit to get a lot of action. And, you know, it's a call to action on all of our parts to get, get those consumer products organized. Because once you get them, the, the oil companies become irrelevant. Um, that's what you've got. You, you, if you can cut them off there, I think that's, that's the place to really fight your fight. That's my opinion. I'd love to hear from Mr. Brandt. Maybe he, I mean, he's in the trenches now. Heck, I'm just a higher educator person. I don't. I don't get in those fights anymore. Okay, thank you for that. I, I agree. I mean, I, I personally think that every industry has a certain responsibility in this process. I agree with you that we can um, look at not just the oil producers or the, the, the plastic manufacturers themselves, but think creatively all along the, the food chain, so to speak. Um, and look for opportunities for improvement. And, and just to kind of go back to the, the general, the, the initial question, I am quite optimistic. I think that we, I, I've studied history, so I, I see that it takes a long time and it's messy and chaotic and sometimes it's two steps forward and, so, and one step back, but progress does get made. And uh, we need to focus on, on taking those steps um, and I think Eric, uh, Dr. Schwartz did a fantastic job of talking about the, uh, the political obstacles that have to be overcome in order to make these things happen. But I do think that there are examples where we have seen um, externalities and, and, and hidden costs passed back to the in industries in a responsible way. And so I, I do think we'll get there. I don't know exactly what what form it will all take, but I do think we're making progress. Great. Um, we have a comment from, is it Hodan? Um, I'm a high school teacher in VA. Do any organizations of PR representatives come to local schools to give talks about plastic awareness? 
that be? Um, you might want to check with your county to see if they have like a recycling coordinator in that county. Um, you do have Trex in Winchester, who I know I have seen a rep from, from their company come and, and do some talks about plastics. Obviously, they want to make people more aware of the plastic bag and the shrink wrap industry so that they can collect more and more of it. Um, that's that's their business and that's what they do. Um, so they sure as heck don't want to see plastic bags being put into a landfill and things of that nature. But I would um, just start with your county and solid waste department, see if they have a recycling department, which I'm sure they do, and see if there's folks there who can uh, help you out starting at that point. And um, Trex would definitely be somebody I would contact for sure. Yeah, I just sent her... Um a link to the Great Falls group um, in Virginia. I will look it up further and see if they have a direct phone number, maybe a Facebook page. Um, and also earlier, Anthony, you mentioned about plastic hangers and plastic bags. And I know in Washington County, um, many thrift stores take those. Um, for example, World Treasures Thrift Store. Um, I worked there last summer and we can always use more hangers and plastic bags because all of the bags that World Treasures uses are secondhand from donations and the same with hangers. So if you ever have a lot of plastic hangers or bags, you can most likely drop them off at your local thrift stores. Hey, thanks. That's good to know because I know um, we were having a major issue with a local company who was just generating so many hangers. And, and I talked to a lot of different places. I didn't go to World Treasures. They might not even been in business at the time, but I, I have talked to them a, a couple of times. And I know uh, Krista Hart, no, um, Kathy Hart, Thomas know her very well. So I'll definitely uh, check with them because I do get phone calls from time to time. And that would be great to send folks there instead of seeing them going to the landfill. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, guys. Um, I have another question from a student, Madison. In the movie, there was a grocery store that had unpackaged wholesale foods and other products. Why aren't we seeing that locally and what can be done to implement that in our area? Mm -hmm. I want to take that. Um, I would su suggest um, contacting some of the local groceries that, uh, again, consumer pressure is powerful and, and it doesn't mean it happens right away, but contact Martins. Say, hey, you know what? I'd really like to see less, less reliance on plastic packaging. Let, let the management know this is an issue that is important. If they don't hear from us, whether it's politicians or the store owners, they're not going to pay attention. That's my two cents. That's great. That's interesting because down in Frederick, you know, you have the mom store and we have, you know, all the Whole Foods and all that. So I guess I'm not familiar with Washington County, but maybe there might be hopefully in the future, right? That's hopefully with Martins. Um, so. Excuse me. Can I just add to what uh, Dr. Schwartz just said? Um, I know a lot of people have questions and, and I think the advice is very good. Um, I just want to throw out one more um, uh I can't think of the right word, but uh, one, one more opportunity to toot the zero waste horn here, which is you're not alone. If you are a little bit reluctant to do this on your own or you just have questions, um, feel free to contact me, join the zero waste team, either one. Um, we will try to answer your questions. And I do believe that the more of us who work together, there is a benefit to collective action. So we can apply pressure. I don't know if that's the right word necessarily, but we can apply more pressure as a group than we can as individuals. And I just uh, shared in the chat, um, all of our contact information, panelists, including myself. Um, if you have any other questions after the event, feel free to email um, anybody. Um, Please. And uh, I think we're going to wrap up with us. Uh, I would like to actually introduce um, it's Rebecca uh, McDermott, our developmental coordinator, is going to share what HCC is doing to reduce plastic waste. Thank you, Jane. Um, this has been a great discussion about a very serious issue. Um, and um, I've learned a lot myself. Um, before I share what HCC is doing, I just want to thank everyone for their time and expertise today, including Dr. Beecroft, 
uh, Michael, Anthony, Peggy, um, Dr. Schwartz, um, we appreciate you taking the time to discuss this very important issue with us and, and helping elevate it to its importance that it needs to be. Um, I also want to thank the individuals who helped bring us this presentation today. Um, Jane, of course, Heather Barnhart, Brittany Hember, Sarah Conrad, who's been working behind the scenes um, in the library, um, along with Kendra Perry, and of course, um, Dr. Clauber. Um, thank you so much for taking um, a lead on plastic waste reduction and other environmental issues on campus. It's very important and um, we're thankful for your time. Um, and while the plastic waste reduction is a complicated problem, I think we all have a better sense of the steps we need to take um, as a society and as individuals to reduce plastic usage and waste. With that in mind, I'd like to share a few things that we're doing here on campus um, to do our part. Um, and first, and uh, I apologize, Dr. Clauber, if I'm stealing your thunder on this one, um, the campus will be installing bottle filling stations across campus. Um, these bottle filling stations, you'll be able to use a, re a refillable bottle like this one, um, which we will also be giving to our panelists and to anyone who we use their question. Um, and that will help cut down on single-use plastics on campus. Uh, we will also be installing new no before you throw signs above our recycling stations on campus. Um, and that will help this community cut down on all the non-recyclable and contaminated items that are ending up in the recycling stream. And I am also taking Dr. Clauber's uh, words about K-cups to heart, and we will stop using single use K-cups in our office and um, hopefully everyone else will do the same as well. And finally, I just wanna thank everyone who um, stayed with us this afternoon um, and to our other community members who will be watching this at a later date. Um, I want you to remember to check out the resources on the LibGuide um, and think about the actions that you can take to reduce plastic waste. Um, thank you, everyone. It's been a long but very informative afternoon. Um, feel free to reach out to anyone who participated today if you have further questions, um, and have a fantastic Earth Day. <laughs>